Hey Mark, so you're one of the co-authors of Hadoop Application Architectures? Yes. Yes, and you gave a talk here in Singapore about that topic? Yeah. Why has that remained popular? You wrote that, what, two years ago? Right, it got published about six months ago. We started writing it about two years ago. Right, yeah. right, no, it took a while to write. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it does. There were four of us and it still took a while. Yeah. So why, why, are, why are application architectures important? Right, that's a good question. I think that was primarily what drove us to write the book as well. I think there is a huge gap between um, companies that build the Hadoop platform and uh, provide people that platform to build their large scale applications with and the uh, regular enterprise software developer who works at a bank or at an e-commerce company trying to solve that problem that they're very familiar with but have been given this new set of tools that they haven't seen for a while or ever before, right? And so there's a huge opportunity there to bridge that gap um, and that can be done via software, by education, by books, and the way we choose, one of the methods we chose as a group, my, myself and my co-authors, was to write a book that bridged that gap. But you continue to talk about it because it remains important for many right. different application domains? That's true, and um, we all hope that that gap closes as time moves on, but that gap is still the case. Now, mind you, it hasn't been a long time since the book's been published, um, but we do hope that there are companies and um, software artifacts being built that close that gap, but you're right. Okay, so the other thing that intrigued me is that it's Hadoop application architectures, plural. Right. So there are many different architectures that you're, is, are they domains or right. what, what are That's we talking point. about? Yeah, you could classify architectures based on their requirements. Uh, and so they don't even have to be similar use cases in the end, but from an architectural perspective, the Hadoop ecosystem is just flourishing with all these components. Um, I would say a typical distribution of Hadoop contains maybe 20 odd projects. Uh, in the ecosystem that's larger across distributions, we may have maybe 50 projects in total. Many of these projects actually solve the same purpose, but many of them are quite complementary to each other. They're kind of like Lego pieces that you kind of have to put together, and sometimes one Lego piece can fit in the same group, right? The, the two biggest questions that I find across our audience, the first one is, which Lego pieces am I going to use to build the Lego monster that my company needs? But once I've chosen those Lego pieces, you know, you have to kind of color them or paint them, you have to make those architectural considerations. Um, and that's the second one. So the first part is, how do I pick the projects that I need to build my application? And then once I've chosen these projects, how do I make those nitty gritty design level decisions of configuring these projects to work right? Um, how is that different from a stack? It is, it's not. Um, okay. But different pieces of the stack can be used for different kinds of architectures, and hence the name Hadoop Application Architectures. You can put few of them together, 10 of them together, and build a fraud detection system, uh, which gives you some decisions in real time, like Mike came to Singapore and swiped his credit card and that got rejected. And that's mm -hmm. real time, that's one architecture. That's in fact the architecture we fraud talked about. Fraud detection. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's in fact the architecture we talked about in the tutorial yesterday. Uh, but you can uh, have a different architecture which does data mining on your visits to a hotel. So or they can Mike send came to Singapore and he yeah. visits these kind of establishments, send him a coupon. Exactly, right. right. So that would be a data warehousing architecture that typically uses a different set of tools than a traditional fraud detection architecture. So one company, one large company may use several right. different architectures. Right. You, yeah. For their whatever solution they're trying to solve. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what, what industries do you see gravitating most towards different architecture? I mean, is there, are there different industries that, that really clom on to the architecture concept right. more than others? I mean, it, to me, it seems like startups may just wing it and fly. Right, right. I'm not sure if that's a, a yeah. really a way to say it, but yeah. as opposed to like a bank right. who might want the fraud detection and right. the, you know, they have a mortgage with me, they have their bank account with me, right. send them information on college right. funds and right, all that. Right, right, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would say there are definitely quintessential use cases and quintessential industries, right? So if you're anything to do with uh, banks or money, you ha are highly invested in figuring out fraud sooner than later. In fact, Fraud detection also exists, or anomaly detection is a larger category where you're trying to figure out anomalies, exists in uh, 
um, non-typical scenarios as well. So if you think of a gaming industry and you are uh, building a real, real-time multiplayer game, you still have the same concepts of having some money and buying some tools or guns from that money. And there is the same idea of money laundering exists in this virtual world. So a lot of game companies are also invested in tools like fraud detection. All the information security companies that monitor your network as data goes to your servers or to your computers or out of your servers and computers to figure out there's mal malware or viruses on your computer or figure out if uh, you're trying to do a domain uh, denial of service attack somewhere else. Also use this sort of river of flowing data to try to figure out if there's fraudulent activity happening in this. So that's one use case. Um, another one, like you said before, is about coupons and things of that sort. But coupon sounds bad. It's not necessarily used for bad. It's just monitoring activity and uh, trying to figure out, say, a lifetime value of a client in an organization where um, you have customer-facing clients. It could be a clothing store trying to figure out what is what kind of shirts does Mike like and, uh, again, show him advertisements or send coupons about that kind of stuff. So that's another category. Another one is event analysis. So this could be events that happen on a website based on your activity, but could also be uh, events that happen from a computer or a machine. Uh, could be uh, if you are in a TSA scanner as you walk by um, or through a clear or um, an x-ray machine, what kind of events are being logged and being ana do, uh, doing analysis on those events. Another interesting use case could be in the health sciences industry where you are taking the genome of a person, sequencing that, um, and then finding the mutations in that genome sequence, comparing it with the rest of the genome, mm -hmm. and then seeing if they're susceptible to a particular form of cancer or not. Yeah, that seems really promising. So even simple things like a retailer wanting to know a seasonal pattern of, like, we need to accelerate on Cyber Monday. Right, yeah. And increase our bandwidth or whatever it yeah. is. Like, the target s instance wouldn't happen yeah. if they had known that ahead yeah, of time? Yeah, totally, totally. So there's an architecture for that sort of thing? Or is that a use case? It's a use case, and an architecture can cater to multiple different use cases. Um, which architecture you choose for a use case, uh, and this is where things get tricky, is usually done today by talking to someone in the field, someone like a Domain Meyer. expert. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they will help you design that, or help you figure out which architecture do you choose for your use case. I would love for us to get to a point where that domain expert uh, is not needed, right? I would love for me so to machine lose my learning, or <laughs> Is it ML that's going to help that go away, or? Because it's uh, still going to come back down to like human decisions, isn't it? Perhaps, but I would, I would like to think that there could be software that would be written that would just abstract away all the complicated decisions from users and uh, make it dumb enough in some sense so people who, have, who are used to the existing tools from the old school enterprise days uh, can very easily transition to this new set of tools that are part of the Hadoop ecosystem. So to make software that's dumb enough, it has to be really smart. Correct, yeah. Right. And it has to be built on top of the existing Hadoop ecosystem software that has um, evolved. I have seen most of the growth in the ecosystem to be very breadth-oriented. What I mean by that is because it started from the core, you have to cover your bases, right? You have to bring in security. You have to add um, optimized file formats and things of that sort. But what I really see a need for is this vertical sort of growth where we really connect the foundation, the platform, with the end users. And again, we've tried to solve that problem with a book, but uh, I hope there's some software there to make that easy as well. So if we have this conversation 12 months from now, yeah. are you hoping the book is almost irrelevant because everyone will have understand the architectures? Or right. you, what will yeah. change in the next 12 months that will be good for the industry? That's a good question. I'll give you one example that I think is a very good example of what has changed. So 12 months ago, there wasn't um, this thing called Kudu. Now, Kudu is a mm -hmm. new storage platform that was announced at Strata in New York a few months ago. And it takes away a lot of complexity that people had in terms of um, what file format do I store my data in, what compression codec do I use, what schema design, what row key do I use, things of that sort. And even before, people had to choose on this graph. If I drew like 
scan capabilities versus random read ca write capabilities. One of the options HDFS did very well on one axis and did poorly on the other. And the other option HBase did very well on that the other axis and did very badly on the other. And Kudu kind of is like this happy medium which sits right in between there, and it takes out a lot of complexity. Uh, mind you, it's still beta; it's not production ready. But I think that's a very significant effort that has become public in the past 12 months that takes that complexity away, right? So I would uh, anticipate things of that nature happening. And it's open source as well. Kudu is open source as right. well, Right, so absolutely. you can get it with, through Apache, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's important for the data world. Absolutely, I think we're disrupting industries that have been around for a while, and the adoption, the credibility of the software, and the inclusion of a larger ecosystem of users and developers would not exist if it wasn't for open source. So that's absolutely important. Excellent. Mark, we look forward yeah. to that conversation in 12 months. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Mike.